Okay, so last weekend I finished up work on the front spar here. Uh, match drilling, some countersinking, and a lot of deburring. And then I went ahead and primed uh, all the rear spar uh, assembly components as well as the front spar assembly components here. The priming went really well. I feel like uh, third tries a charm, I guess, with the spray gun. I'm starting to get the hang of it. Uh, still won't be painting my car anytime soon, and I probably won't endeavor to paint the outside of the plane, but I'm getting pretty comfortable and reasonably competent painting uh, parts that I'll never have to actually look at. So i um, real happy with that. Today, I'm gonna go backwards in the plans a little bit and uh, do some of the steps that I skipped over in order to have a, a batch of parts to prime. Uh, so that'll be page two, steps five and six, page three, step two, and then I'll fast forward sort of where I am, which is page six, uh, and try and do steps one and two. All those steps are riveting together uh, the pieces that make up the, the two spar subassemblies. So uh, riveting these, uh, these hinge brackets and the doubler to this rear spar, uh, bolting this guy to the rear spar as well, and then riveting together uh, the front spar, spar caps, doubler, and uh, the mounting brackets, the attachment brackets. I probably won't torque uh, torque this guy down yet. I don't need to torque it down until I'm about to close up the horizontal stabilizer and I'm a ways to go from that. Uh, so anyway, uh, that's what I'm going to try and do today. So I'll get going. All right, well, so first things first, there are a few holes that you don't want to accidentally put rivets in yet. Uh, those are going to hold ribs on eventually. So I'll go ahead and cover those up with tape and then get the doubler Coleco to the rear spar here. And so after some fiddling around, I decided it'd be easiest to hang the spar off of these 2x4s that I've got clamped to the table here. Uh, and then I also uh, switched out for the flange nose yoke on the squeezer. But other than that, it's uh, just a matter of riveting every other hole and moving the Clecos and then doing the ones in between. So you'll probably notice me uh, look like I'll pick up and leave the room with the spar to flip it around. Um, it's about 11 feet long and this is kind of a narrow, uh, long narrow room in my basement. Technically I can make a 360 degree turn with it, but uh, just being careful not to knock something off a table or a shelf, whack the end of it into something. So in this rear spar, most of the rivets that hold the doubler uh, to the spar web are the same size. They're uh, 474-6s, I believe, and there's 34 of them for anybody who's keeping score. Um, so that's kind of nice. You don't have to keep referring back to the plans and looking at the pattern and making sure you're choosing the right length of rivet. You'll see when I move on to the front spar, it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, there are a few flush head rivets, 426s, right in the center here where this hinge bracket is going to go. So that's what I'm doing there. But uh, other than that, like I say, it's very straightforward. So now I'm moving on to the hinge brackets, uh, the elevator hinge brackets. So uh, one thing you'll see me do, uh, well, for one thing, you'll see me clean them up with acetone here. Uh, that's for a couple of reasons. I had put some marks on them, uh, numbered them with Sharpie, so I could get them all back in the right order. So I'm cleaning that off. But then the other thing is they have a, uh, a sticker on them, you know, a part number sticker. And when you peel that off, it leaves a little residue. So I'm cleaning that up. And finally, you'll see me roughen up the powder coating with uh, some Scotch-Brite pad. I didn't really go crazy on that, and to be perfectly honest, I didn't do it at all on the vertical stabilizer. The plans tell you to, to do that if you intend to paint them when you have the rest of the outside of the plane painted. So now riveting the uh, hinge brackets on, and you can maybe kind of see I'm supplementing my Clecos with some clamps. Uh, there we go. You can see it a little better there. Uh, oh, and look, I'm using my little roll-around stool thing. Uh, so yeah, each each half of the hinge bracket has four holes in it, so you tend to put two Clecos in two of, Clecos in two of the holes and then use the clamp to sort of hold it down in the center and then uh, rivet the other two holes.
And finally, I'm bolting on this center hinge bracket with the bearing in it. I did have to clean out some of the powder coating from the bolt holes before the bolts would fit through. And I also did decide I would not go ahead and torque these down to the final value just yet. I looked in the section five of the plans and the final torque value for these bolts is something pretty low, like two foot pounds. And I just didn't trust my torque wrench uh, with something that low. So I'm gonna get a different torque wrench and do that later. And so carefully putting away the socket set there and done with the rear spar. Jumping ahead a bit now, uh, working on the front spar. So I've got the spar doubler and the spar caps clicked to the spar itself. And I'm now picking out the mini bags of rivets that I'm gonna be using to assemble this whole thing. So when I was talking about the rear spar, I mentioned that it was pretty straightforward, used pretty much the same length of rivet for uh, most of that assembly. On the front spar, not so much. So sometimes you're going through doubler and spar web. Sometimes you're going through doubler, spar web, and spar caps. Uh, sometimes you're going through all those things plus the attachment brackets and you know, there's various combinations. There's AD3s and AD4s and so it takes a lot of different sizes of rivet. No big deal, uh, but that does mean you spend a lot of time readjusting your squeezer and it also means that you want to pay very close attention to the rivet pattern diagram in the plans. Uh, no real mishaps on this. You can see I've got some holes taped off in this spar as well. The reason for that, those are the nine, the two sets of nine holes where the attachment brackets are going to go. So I did run into one little spot of trouble right here. Uh, one of my machine countersink, one of eight machine countersunk holes in the front of this uh, spar doubler. The uh, After priming it just, the rivet head was just not quite as flush as I wanted it. So I did have to take a, uh, took the machine countersink cage and bit and just clean the primer out of that hole. So uh, I do have one hole that doesn't have primer down in it. So I hope the whole plane doesn't corrode and fall out of the sky. Just that one hole, but I think I'll be all right. So this was what I felt like was the most critical step of the day. Um, here I'm going to finally rivet the horizontal stabilizer attachment brackets to the front of the front spar. So I've gone ahead and clamped them to this piece of um, you know angle steel. Uh, this is the same piece that I used in an earlier step in an earlier video to hold these two parts in alignment while I was match drilling. The plans tell you to do that on that step. They don't say anything about repeating it here uh, while you're riveting, but it seemed like a good idea to me. I can't imagine that it would hurt anything. It just provided that extra level of assurance that those two parts would remain, you know, perfectly uh, coplanar while I was uh, riveting them. So uh, that's what I did. This took the biggest rivets that I've used so far. They're 470 AD 4-9s and dash 10s. So uh, that's because it's going through the two brackets as well as the spar doubler, the spar web, and in the case of the dash 10s, it's also going through the spar cap. So uh, this went just fine. You can see there I'm checking the shop heads with the calipers. I'll, uh, I'll talk about that at the end of the video here. And now the last step of the horizontal stabilizer front spar, uh, nine rivets on top and bottom to hold the spar cap to the spar flange where it will be uh, inside of the tail cone and there's no uh, horizontal stabilizer skins. And that's it. Okay, so that was about seven hours worth of work. It uh, doesn't seem like that many rivets, but uh, there are a lot of different sizes, a lot of different lengths, a lot of different uh, thicknesses of material to go through. You've got to keep, you know, adjusting the squeezer for the different lengths. And mainly you just want to take your time and not rush everything and make sure you put the right size rivet in the right hole. So everything went well. I didn't have to drill anything out and I'm real happy with how much I got done. I'm happy with the results. So I got the uh, rear spar riveted together here, the doubler's in place, the hinge brackets are riveted in place, and this guy, uh, inboard hinge bracket with the bearing in it, is bolted in place. 
I haven't torqued these down yet. I've talked about that. Uh, I've got a sticky note in the plans to remind me to come back and do that. But uh, I'll have access to these pretty much forever. Uh, I was thinking for a while that it, they'd be covered by skin eventually. Uh, but no, of course not. This is in the inside above the tail cone. They'll be covered by fairings way down the road when I you know, put the fairings in place. But uh, even then, you'd want to be able to take the fairings off and inspect them or whatever. So I'll be able to torque these down, you know, whenever. Uh, so I also got the front spar riveted together. So again, the doubler, uh, spar caps are riveted under here, and then the attachment brackets are riveted on. So uh, it was good to get that done. A couple of things I ran into or uh, decisions I made, things I... Um, uh, things I did. So I put the shop heads, all the shop heads are on the front of the rear spar and manufactured heads on the back of the rear spar. They tell you to put the manufactured heads on the back of these brackets. They don't tell you why uh, and they don't say anything about these rivets. I went ahead and made and put all the manufactured heads on the back partly for consistency, partly because uh, this will be sort of on the exterior of the plane. The elevators will be here, but in theory this is exposed. Um, and I feel like I've read somewhere that there are places in the plans where they specifically tell you to put manufactured heads on the on the this part of the spar to allow clearance for a control surface. And that seems a little hard to believe that the clearance would be that tight. It can't possibly be that tight for the elevator. I just don't see how that could physically be the case. Uh, and it better not be the case for the vertical stabilizer and rudder because all my shop heads, they didn't say one way or the other in the plans, and all my shop heads are on the back of the vertical stabilizer. So, um, you know, hope my rudder moves. Uh, I think I'll be fine. So, uh, yeah, a couple other things. Uh, so on, on the front spar here, I put all the, all the shop heads, all the shop heads on the back, all the manufactured heads on the front. Again, mostly for consistency, there were, there are some flush head rivets here, so by definition the manufactured heads would be here, and I, so I just did the rest the same way, plus I just think it looks prettier. Um, all this, of course, will be covered up, but at least I'll know. A couple other things I ran into, so I did have a case where with these really big rivets, these dash 10s, down the, the bottom three of each of the brackets here are dash 10s, huge rivets. And uh, the top six of each are dash nines. That was a case where, as Vans mentions in the plans, where they, they add up you know, the thicknesses of the material they're going to go through, and they pick a rivet, and they sort of err on the short side. And I don't know if there's such thing as a dash 10.5 or a dash 11. If there's a dash 11, I suppose you could take a dash 11 and cut it down just a tiny bit. But uh, no matter, they're in spec. It's just that if you use the little gauge here, uh, like I have, like I use, it makes you think that the, the diameter of the, of the shop head is a little on the small side because these gauges are really sort of biased toward the max. Um, I've mentioned that before. If you get out some calipers, you can have a rivet that this fits pretty loosely on and then you measure it with calipers and it's totally, totally in spec uh, for the mill spec. And frankly, if you if you were to keep on squeezing it to make it tight on this this little gauge, it would be too short on this part of the gauge, which is also at the max. So again, with some of these, I just pulled out the calipers and and made sure that they were in spec um, uh, per the military uh, the mil spec document. That's about it. Um, again, I'm really happy with what I got done. Uh, what's going to come next? So the next steps are to take four of these inspar ribs and cut a notch out of them. And that notch will be part of uh, the, the box that you build using the, the long and short stringers here. This is the long one, uh, the long and short stringers and the thing called the stringer web, which is a little flimsy seeming uh, rectangle of aluminum that I'm sure once you create this box with it, it's all gonna be very strong and that'll be sitting right in here. So. Uh, that's what I'll be working on next time.